Energy independence. Two words that have become a mantra in U.S. politics. Energy independence by 2020. For decades, we have known the days of cheap and easily accessible oil were numbered. For years now, make our dependence on Middle Eastern oil a thing of the past. The United States has tried to lower its dependence on foreign oil for its energy needs. 65% of our oil is imported. With stability in the Middle East in question, drilling at home has never been more attractive. The attack comes from the sky. But it often comes at a cost. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill. The economic impact is more obvious than the environmental one. Natural gas extraction, fracking, is being touted as the answer. Abundant, cleaner burning, affordable. But where fracking is taking place, there are questions being asked about the process and its implications. Alberta water. Sometimes it will light just like that. People have been aware for decades that the rock formation known as the Marcellus Shell has natural gas trapped inside it. But it took Professor Terry Engelder to figure out how much was there. Oh, it is. Okay, let me whack at it and uh, break. And what he found? Oh, boy. Shocked everyone. Wow. Yeah. Without a doubt. It smells like gas. It smells um, it's, it's a surprisingly chemical um, smell. That way. In 2007, Engelder calculated that the Marcellus was one of the richest gas fields in the world. So what we'll do right now is walk up. With enough to supply the U.S. for nearly 20 years. Buried deep underground, it stretches from here in Pennsylvania, south to West Virginia, and north into New York. But getting to it requires a controversial process called horizontal hydraulic fracturing, better known as fracking. A well is drilled vertically and then deviated to a horizontal position. And to release the gas, millions of liters of water, chemicals, and sand are forced into the hole with enough pressure to shatter the rock. Then you can capture gas back here because it will. In the evolution of mankind, Man has evolved from one energy to the next. Right now, I think we're going to move into an age that will be the gas age. It won't last long. It might last uh, a century. And that century will buy us time to move into the use of renewables. Not long after Engelder's discovery, Agents, contracted by natural gas companies, spread across the Pennsylvania countryside, buying leases from landowners. When they were drilling, if you went down the road here a little piece and looked up the valley, you could see the drilling rig and stuff, but you can't from here. Dairy well, farmer Leroy Druschel was one of those who signed on the dotted line. Up from up at the For his family farm, the money came just in time. In 2009, the U.S. economy was in recession. Milk prices had taken a record drop and his livelihood was at risk. Yeah, you know, we weren't making nothing. We had to fall back on savings, but we had lease money when we signed the farm up for leasing for the ground. And then right after that, there were some pipelines come in. We got pipeline money and a combination of those two things from the gas companies. That's what held this farm, you know, made it survive. Otherwise, I think we'd been out of business right now. There are already about 5,000 shell gas wells in the state and Engelder anticipates another 95,000 to come. Many people in Pennsylvania, like Leroy, have benefited financially from the boom. But there are also plenty of people here who wish that gas had never come to the state. Down the road from Leroy's farm is the Woodlands, a small community of lower income housing and trailer homes. I don't drink my water. I don't bathe in my water. I don't use my water for anything. In 2010, the gas company, Rex Energy, started drilling in this area, sinking more than 15 wells. Then, in January 2011, Janet McIntyre says something changed in her water overnight. When did you notice a change in your water? We were sick. My family becomes sick. We were projectile vomiting, diarrhea, um, 
my my husband got up in the middle of the night and I asked him to give me a drink of water. And he come out to the kitchen and turned on the spigot and nothing come out but foam, purple foam. Methane, acetone, trichloroph you know what I mean? It's right. basically got the same stuff in it. Carbon tetrachloride, toluene. Janet says her neighbors were having similar problems. So they contacted Rex Energy and Pennsylvania's Department of Environmental Protection, or DEP. The DEP told us they found nothing wrong with the water at the woodlands. You know, I'd asked the DEP and Rex Energy the first time they come here, did something happen at that well up there that we need to know about? Nothing happened at that well, Mrs. McIntyre. Well, guess what? Something happened at that well. And something did happen. A shareholder's report from Rex Energy confirmed two wells near Janet's home had issues with the parts designed to prevent leakage. One of the faulty wells was noted on the state's DEP website. But for the second well, the problems were not made public. Rex Energy says the issues were fixed. I was so angry because I wasn't getting water. I just kind of like flipped it off to the side. So truly, when I ask, did something happen at that well up there? Were they lying or covering up? They were told, well, all the operations are to the Concerned south. Concerned by the stories coming out of the woodlands, Dr. John Stoltz, a biologist, began studying the water there. Pre-testing around well sites is not standardized, and often the results are not shared with homeowners. If you want to build a road or if you want to build uh, a department store or a mall, you have to do an environmental impact study. You have to have this all, in, all this information. You have to have remediation strategies and this, that, the other thing. If you're disturbing a wetland, you have to restore a wetland somewhere else. This industry is exempt from it. Through aggressive lobbying, the gas industry has secured exemptions from a host of U.S. federal environmental laws and regulations. For instance, the Safe Drinking Water Act. This permits them to inject known carcinogens and toxins into the ground. Public disclosure of certain fracking chemicals is strictly voluntary in most states. Publicly, the industry maintains that cementing and well casings are safe, even though their own studies prove that's not always the case. Right now, everything is guilt by association. But when you look at incidents of contamination without fail, it's so far in the, my limited data set, there's always a casing failure, or in most cases. The contamination is real. There are problems. This is forced upon us, you know. We're forced to, to go without water or to drink what we have. Every day, I wake up thinking about water. Water's for coffee. Think about water, 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 water. Christ's sake, I go to bed thinking about water. You know, and, and how much water I gotta have the next day. And no matter what, the gas company's right. The DEP sides with them, and we have to live with that. The data that we have, uh, in my opinion, conclusively shows, conclusively shows that oil and gas activities have not impacted the water supplies there. The DEP insists that there is nothing wrong with the water in the woodlands. I know the folks um, disagree with the department's determination, um, but we have to make our decisions based on, on, on science, based on the test results that we have. But new evidence challenges that. In September 2012, a division director within the DEP testified that the agency created incomplete lab reports in cases of suspected fracking contamination in the state including in the woodlands. The DEP responded, saying further testing wasn't necessary. The woodland story isn't isolated. On the other side of the state, in the small town of Dimmick, Ray Kimball is on his rounds delivering water to his neighbors, who say their wells are contaminated. Oh, you got neighbor against neighbor, town against town. Yeah, it's crazy, because you got different ones, you know, they're making all kinds of big money off, and they want the money, they don't care. After Cabot Oil and Gas started drilling in and around the town in 2008, the well water in many people's homes went bad. 
water treatment solution as inadequate, some families still provide for themselves, for themselves. You always got to get here somehow. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else cares what happens down here. Yeah, they've all turned their backs on Dimmick, you know. Like most of his neighbors, Ray accepted an out-of-court settlement with Cabot. Today, he's delivering water to Scott Ely, one of the few Dimmick residents who has refused to settle. My nine acres weren't stopping them at all. He said, well, we're just going to take your gas anyhow. So I ended up signing, and uh, then I ended up going to work for him. Cabin installed a well pad on his family's property in 2008. We have two wells here. Uh, one's a horizontal, one's a vertical. Hmm. And then you got your brine tanks here. It's nothing but soil that's going to keep them from uh, leaching out. Hmm. But while working for the company, he said he became uncomfortable with what he saw on the drill sites and turned whistleblower. We had a unit over there catch on fire. It literally was on fire. And then we had a failure on this well here where they couldn't shut it down. The valve totally washed out. How common were spills? Quite frequent. I mean, the time I was with them, we had um, three, three major diesel fuel spills. I'm talking over 1,000 gallons of diesel fuel on the ground. I mean, it's just constant all the time. We were having issues. You know, lines would blow. In 2009, an employee at the DEP took video of one of Cabot's leaky gas wells in Dimmick, evidence of its poor drilling procedures contaminating nearby water wells. Cabot denied it, blaming naturally occurring methane. I mean, when they have something go wrong, it's a catastrophe. So After notifying yeah, Cabot of multiple incidents, including drug use by other workers, Scott says the company told him not to come to work. But even at home, Scott couldn't escape the repercussions of Cabot's drilling activities. He noticed that the water coming out of his drinking well had gone bad. My name is Scott Ely, and EPA says my water is fine to drink. It's not normal water. Yeah. The water we used to drink used to be nice and clear. That's not. It's really not nice and clear. My family was sick. I, I had three little kids here that were complaining of having headaches and belly aches. And we get these cramps. I'm telling you, cramps like you felt like you ate something really terrible and it knot your stomach up real bad. And then the wife, she kept coming down, and the kids too. Not as much as her, though. I mean rashes. I'm talking blotches like this all over her back. Cabot has always denied they're to blame for the contaminated drinking wells around Dimmick. But in 2009, the state of Pennsylvania determined that Cabot's drilling had caused contamination in Scott's well, as well as more than a dozen other wells in the area. The company was fined $240,000. Scott is determined to take Cabot to court. We are up against probably one of the biggest industries. And uh, you kind of feel lonely. <laughs> you feel like uh, our legislators and they're not behind me. You know, they, they want to see this all go away. I'm convinced that we are at the beginning of a new industrial revolution. It can bring us jobs. It can bring us prosperity. While protecting the landscape from damage, Pennsylvania is getting it right. In Philadelphia, at a Shell Gas Conference, Executives from all the big players have gathered to listen to Pennsylvania's Republican Governor, Tom Corbett. And you are the tip of the spear. This is an industry that is creating much needed jobs. The governor is firmly in their corner, exempting the gas companies from paying taxes on production. It is beyond belief that there are still people who would trade this progress for a return to the status quo. After all the predictions of disaster, and the fearful warnings from people with no understanding of the industry, Pennsylvania is reaping a bounty. Outside the conference, protesters are angry at a governor who received over a million dollars from the oil and gas industry for his 2010 election campaign. This is one of the most critical public health, public safety, environmental, and community protection issues of our day. And you politicians will be judged in the history books. 
They use the term energy independence for America. It's not independent, it's dependent on the extreme technologies, those extreme tax breaks, and extreme lack of regulatory control by the state and federal government. Those are the extremists. We know that we've got democracy out here, but something else is happening in there. Something far more nefarious. You guys thirsty up there? Here in Pennsylvania, it's a sad day because we've got a government that is a wholly owned subsidiary of the gas industry at this point. Now you have a, an industry that's across the street campaigning with Governor Corbett and with Michael Krantzer, the secretary of the DEP, the secretary of the Department of Environmental Protection. The people who are supposed to be protecting Pennsylvanians from harm of industry are over in the gas industry convention talking about how great they are. Now that's a takeover of our government. When it comes to fracking, it's hard to see daylight between the two biggest political parties in the United States. Natural gas isn't just appearing magically. We're encouraging it and working with the industry. This has not been Mr. Oil or Mr. Gas or Mr. Coal. I'll get America and North America energy independent. I'll do it by more drilling, more permits and licenses. We've got potentially 600,000 jobs and 100 years worth of energy right beneath our feet with natural gas. And we can do it in an environmentally sound way. Both Republicans and Democrats say fracking is needed until cleaner energy like wind and solar becomes cost efficient. Using shale gas as a so-called bridge fuel is foolish nonsense. It's not a transition, it's a walk the plank. We've got about 30 years to drastically decrease the use of all fossil fuels. And what the gas industry wants us to believe is we ought to speed up the use of one fossil fuel, accelerate towards that wall, and then put the brakes on at the last minute. Sorry, that doesn't work for me. For decades, Professor Tony Ingrafia did research and development for the oil and gas industry. But in 2011, he and a colleague published a study which found that natural gas produced from unconventional sources like shell actually emits more greenhouse gases than coal. The industry hit back, launching an online campaign to discredit him and his study. The group was called America's Natural Gas Alliance. How many times have we seen a science question be manhandled by the industry that's the culprit? And they produce pseudoscience to cast doubt on what's coming out in peer reviews. The average person on the street is going to say, well, ANGA, the American National Gas Alliance, said people at Cornell are wrong. Well, maybe they are. End of story, we just killed science. America's Natural Gas Alliance is not the only group to have attacked Ingrafia's study. The Independent Petroleum Association of America started its own online information campaign in 2009 named Energy In Depth, or EID. It was first funded by companies like BP, Shell, and Halliburton to fight new environmental regulations on fracking. We went to speak to EID. Tony Ingrafia. Cornell University. The, the quote on your website is that he's uh, more worthy of a Greenpeace activist than an Ivy League faculty member. Is, is that something you would stand by? If it's on our website, then sure. It, this seems to be anyone who steps up. If you have bad water and you say something in the press, if you're an academic, if you're a scientist, if you're a doctor, EID will go after you. That's not true. That's not true. What Energy In Depth does is when there are allegations that are made or research that is done that is either mistaken or perhaps biased, we point out those mistakes, we point out those bias, those biases. The frenzy over the Marcellus Shale doesn't stop at the Pennsylvania border. Gas companies are now looking north to the state of New York. But the state government here has put the brakes on fracking for now. Pennsylvania has opened its doors to fracking, almost in an unregulated Wild West kind of way, and we're, we're shocked and horrified. And we have decided to have a moratorium. So for four years, we have forbidden fracking in New York, and uh, as we uh, assess the environmental health risks. Still, it seems as if it's a matter of when, not if fracking comes to New York. The state's governor, Andrew Cuomo, is reportedly considering lifting the moratorium in five counties. 
And even one of the largest environmental groups in the U.S. has been working with the gas industry and pro-fracking state officials. Hydraulic fracturing is already a reality in the United States, so to say, well, we have to stop it when it's clearly happening, I think uh, perhaps unrealistic is perhaps the better word to use. We think it's unrealistic to expect that we're going to put this genie back in the bottle. L.G. Holstein is from the Environmental Defense Fund, one of the staunchest green groups in American history. This year, the fund accepted $6 million from New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg for work on fracking. From the environmental community standpoint, what we want to do is to keep the doors open for collaboration with the states. We want to help share best practices, and for that, we're delighted to be working closely with the industry to help formulate those things, those kinds of practice, environmental practices, safeguards, if you will. I think that the mainstream environmental movement is asleep at the switch here, and they've forgotten their mandate. Now, they are working on hand in glove with the fossil fuel industry to try to build a safer cigarette, namely to make fracking somehow safer. In my view, there is no evidence to suggest that can be done. Um, I challenge EDF to show me that evidence. In New York, we visited a vigil for Susan Walker, one of three protesters arrested for trespassing at the site of a planned gas storage facility on Seneca Lake. She was sentenced to 15 days in prison. It's, it's as American as apple pie uh, to go out when you're not being heard by the powers that be to shed some light on some injustice. The infrastructure for, for hydro fracking is being built on the, the western shore of Seneca Lake even as we speak. I happen to be a registered Republican. No, it's not left, it's not right, it's just right and it's wrong. It's not clear if the anti-fracking movement can hold up the barricades in New York for much longer, no matter how much noise they make. Fracking is being presented by the energy industry and by many politicians as a simple, stark choice. One of those choices is these two wars that have been fought to maintain a certain stability in the Middle East so that petroleum continue to flow, or domestic production at the sacrifice of people around Demick who have, have uh, uh, themselves felt put upon. But the very concept of energy independence, in a world where the market is global and where energy is both bought and sold by the United States, is misleading. It's a useful catchphrase and a political slogan that allows both the industry and politicians to avoid making real and expensive decisions and take a leading role in moving beyond fossil fuels. There are moments in history when our political leaders decide it's time to rise up and be the leader for a grassroots movement. We're still blasting fossilized animals and plants out of the ground and lighting them on fire. How, it, it's, a, it's a Neanderthal, 19th century, brutal, destructive, toxic process, and it's killing us and it's killing the planet. <laughs>